So one of the things that millennials, like myself, really do not enjoy is this concept called being left on red. If you're not familiar with the concept, it's when you send a text message to a friend or a Facebook message or WhatsApp or whatever kind of message, usually a question, something you'd like a response to, and your phone says that your friend has gotten the message and that they've seen the message, but they don't respond. They've left you on red because they've read the message. It's not like sending a voicemail or an email where you're not quite sure whether they've gotten it or not and they'll respond on their own time. No, it says like they have read this message and are not responding. So it leaves you in kind of an awkward situation. Do you wait a bit longer for them to reply? Do you repeat your message? Do you call them out on ignoring you and say, uh, hey, what's up, why, why didn't you reply? Or do you decide, well, maybe I won't respond the next time they send me a message? Or uh, being, this being upset might turn to anxiety. You might think, did, did I do something wrong? Did I offend them? Or something else along those lines. And it's not just younger people, you know, having a shorter attention span and wanting instant communication. There's this difference because we see that they've seen the message and they're just not responding. It's that experience of knowing you're being deliberately ignored that can really just kind of get to you. This can happen in prayer sometimes. And I think it's especially happening a lot right now. People aren't able to come to church still and they aren't able to experience God as they're used to. They aren't as easily able to hear the voice of God responding to their prayers. And many people who are able to come to church were, were so surrounded by noise and stress and anxiety that it's hard to filter all of that out to hear God's presence. And people who feel trapped in habitual sin, even after receiving absolution and confession, might not hear God as they cry to help for assistance in overcoming temptation. Even in good times, everything can be going well for us in our life. But in prayer, it can just seem like God isn't there at all. It's not even a quiet, peaceful silence. It's just nothing. We call to God for help by day and we cry at night before him. We want to hear his voice whom our heart loves. But it's like God is just leaving us unread. And the thing is, it's really easy to know that God, you know, it's really easy to think that God is ignoring us because we know that he's omnipotent. We know that he knows everything. We know when he pray, what he, we know that he knows when we pray. So it's all the more frustrating. And it's easy to think that God might be ignoring us. Maybe it's because we did something wrong. Maybe it's because we need to pray harder. Maybe we even start to think that God has abandoned us or that God doesn't exist at all. The temptation during these difficult times of dryness in prayer can be to despair and to pull away from prayer. But if you think about it, that only really serves to worsen the problem. If we do go to prayer, we might want to yell at God about how we feel, and then we feel guilty about doing that. But here's the secret. You shouldn't feel guilty about doing that. It's perfectly within the realm of prayer to do that. The quintessential examples of prayers in the Bible, the Psalms, are full of times where the psalmist cries out to the Lord in misery and asks why the Lord doesn't seem to be there. Take a listen to Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You are far from my plea and the cry of my distress. Oh my God, I call by day and you give no reply. I call by night and I find no peace. You might recognize the first line of that stanza. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As being one of the Psalms that our Lord quoted when he was on the cross. How, you might ask, did the God-man himself, truly God, feel abandoned by the Father when they had that direct connection? An ancient anonymous commentator wrote on this verse. He said, God is said to have forsaken Jesus in death because he exposed him to the power of his persecutors. He withdrew his protection but did not break the union. He withdrew his protection but did not break the union. 
When we feel this darkness of soul, this turmoil of our spirit, even when we're not aware of any sort of serious, unforgiven sin that's keeping us from God, it's not the case that God is just ignoring us. It's that he's calling us to exercise our spiritual muscles in a new way. He's withdrawn his protection from various assaults of the world so that we can learn how to fight them with his help. He's still there. He has not broken the union, even when it's difficult, even if we're struggling to see the light. God may have for a time withdrawn his protection from temptation from us, but he's not broken that intimate union that he has with us, and he's still there, even in that silence. The very next verses of Psalm 22 say, Yet you, O God, are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted, and you set them free. When they cried to you, they escaped. In you they trusted, and never in vain. In you they trusted, and never in vain. When we feel spiritually desolate, and we trust in God and cling to him all the more, all the more does God bring about good work in our souls and draw us closer to him. In our second reading, we hear, the Spirit comes to the aid of our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes with inexpressible groanings. During these times of seeming spiritual emptiness, when we don't know what to do or how to pray and it seems like our prayers are just going into the void, our groaning out to God in these words and emotions is heard by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit makes these groans into a prayer to the Father. St. John of the Cross said, God values in you an inclination to aridity and suffering for love of him more than all possible consolations, spiritual visions, and meditations. It's in these groanings, these murmurings in our hearts calling out to God where he most sees our love for him. When it's most difficult and we still turn to him, that's when we express our love for God the most. It's enjoyable to pray when praying feels good and we receive inspiration in prayer, but at times in our lives, our Lord calls us out of what is enjoyable into this more difficult period so that he can draw us closer to himself. So it's all the more important. Whenever we experience a time of dryness in prayer, when we really just don't feel God at all, to remind ourselves that love isn't a feeling. If we think about relationships between, you know, married couples or boyfriend, girlfriend, if you just say, oh, this, this relationship doesn't feel good anymore. It's not happy anymore. Well, that's not love. That's just infatuation. It's when we stick together through these difficult times that our love grows all the stronger. So even in times where it seems like everything in the world is going crazy, when it seems like it's harder to pray more now than ever, perhaps, these are the times all the more when we should be going to God in prayer and laying our entire life out before him and groaning our pains to him. And when love endures through difficult times, it will come out the other side all the stronger.